Section 25 of The Shaving of Shagpat. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabriel Glenn. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith. Chapter 19. The Revival. Now, the feathers of Kuruk in his flight were ruffled by a chill breeze, and they were speeding through a light glow of cold rose colour. Then said Noorna, "'Tis the messenger of morning, the blush. Oh, what changes will date from this day? The glow of rose became golden, and they beheld underneath them on one side the rim of the rising red sun, and rays streaming over the earth and its waters. And Noorna said, I must warn Feshnavat, my father, and prepare him for our coming. So she plucked a feather from Kuruk and laid the quill downward, letting it drop. Then said she, Now for the awakening of my betrothed. Thereupon she hugged his head a moment and kissed him on the eyelids, the cheeks, and the lips, crying, By this means only. Crying that, she pushed him, sliding from the back of the bird, and he parted from them, falling head foremost in the air like a stricken eagle. Then she called to Kuruk, Seize him! And the bird slanted his beak and closed his wings, the two, Abarak and Noorna, clinging to him tightly, and he was down like an arrow between Shibli Bagarag and the ground, spreading beneath him like a tent. And Noorna caught the youth gently to her lap. Then she pushed him off again, intercepting his descent once more till they were on a level with one of the mountains of the earth, from which the city of Shagpat is visible among the yellow sands like a white spot in the yolk of an egg. So by this time the eyes of the youth gave symptoms of a desire to look upon the things that be, peeping faintly beneath the lashes, and she exclaimed joyfully, raising her white hands above her head, One plunge in the lake and life will be his again. Below them was a green lake, tinted by the dawn with crimson and yellow, deep and with high banks. As they crossed it to the middle, she slipped off the youth from Kuruk, and he, with a great plunge, was received into the stillness of the lake. Meanwhile, Kuruk quivered his wings and seized him when he arose, bearing him to an end of the lake where stood one dressed like a devrish, and it was the Wazir Feshnavat, the father of Noorna. So when he saw them, he shouted the shout of congratulation, catching Noorna to his breast, and Shibli Bagarag stretched as doth a heavy sleeper in his last doze, saying in a yawning voice, What trouble? I wot there is not more for us now that Shatpat is shaved. Oh, I have had a dream, a dream! He that is among Huris in paradise dreameth not a dream like that, and I dreamed. Tis gone! Then said he, staring at them, who be ye? What is this? Noorna took him again to her bosom and held him there, and she plucked a herb and squeezed it till a drop from it fell on either of his lids, applying to them likewise a dew from the serpents of the sword, and he awoke to the reality of things. Surely then he prostrated himself and repeated the articles of his faith, taking one hand of his betrothed and kissing her, and he embraced Abarak and Feshnavat, saying to the father of Noorna, I know, O Feshnavat, that by my folly and through my weakness I have lost time in this undertaking. But it shall be short work now with Shagpat. This thy daughter, the eclipser of reason, was ever a prize as she? I will deserve her. Wullahi, I am now a new man, sprung like fire from ashes. Lo, I am revived by her for the great work said Abarak, O master of the event, secure now without delay the two slaves of the sword and lean the blade toward Aklis. Upon that he ran up rapidly to the summit of the mountain and drew the sword from his girdle and leaned it towards Aklis, and it lengthened out over lands, the blade of it a beam of solid brilliance. Presently, from forth the invisible remoteness, they saw the two genie, Karavijis and Vijravush, and they were footing the blade swiftly like stars, speeding up till they were within reach of the serpents of the hilt, when they dropped to the earth, bowing their heads. So he commanded them to rise, crying, Search ye the earth and its confines, and bring hither tidings of the genie Karaz. They said, To hear is to obey. 
Then they began to circle round each other, circling more and more sharply till beyond the stretch of sight, and Shibli Bagarag said to Feshnavat, Am I not awake, O Feshnavat? I will know where is Karaz ere I seek to operate on Shagpat, for it is well spoken of the poet. Obstructions first remove, ere thou thy cunning prove. And I will encounter this Karaz that was our ass, ere I try the great shave. Then he said, turning quickly, Yonder is a light from a cliss, striking on the city, and I mark Shagpat, even he, illumined by it, singled out where he sitteth on the roof of the palace by the marketplace. So they looked, and it was as he had spoken, that Shagpat was singled out in the midst of the city by the wondrous beams of the eye of Aklis, and made prominent in effulgence. Said Abarak, climbing to the level of observation, He hath a redness like the inside of a halved pomegranate. Feshnavad stroked his chin, exclaiming, He may be likened to a mountain goat in the midst of a forest, roaring with conflagration. Said Shibli Bagarag, now is he the red-maned lion, the bristling boar, the uncombed buffalo, the plumaged cock, but soon will he be like nothing else save the wrinkled kernel of a shaggy fruit. Lo, now the sword, it leapeth to be at him, and twill be as the keen icicle of winter to that perishing foliage, that doomed crop. So doth the destined minute destroy with a flash the hoarded arrogance of ages, and the destined hand doeth what creation failed to perform, and tis by order, destiny, and preordainment that the works of this world come to pass. This know I, and I witness thereto that am of a surety ordained to the shaving of Shagpat. Then he stood apart and gazed from Shagpat to the city that now began to move with the morning. Elephants and coursers, saddled by the gates of the king's palace, were visible, and camels blocking the narrow streets and the markets bustling. Surely, though, the sun illumined that city. It was as a darkness behind Shakpat, singled by the beams of Aklis. End of chapter 19 Recording by Gabriel Glenn Section 26 of The Shaving of Shakpat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabriel Glenn The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith Chapter 20 The Plot Now, while Shibli Bagarag gazed on Shagpat, kindled by the beams of Aklis, lo, the genie, Karavijis and Vichravush, circling each other in swift circles like two sapphire rings toward him, and they whirled to a point above his head and fell, and prostrated themselves at his feet. So he cried, O ye slaves of the sword, my servitors, how of the whereabout of Karaz? They answered, O master of the event, we found him after many circlings far off, and twas by the borders of the putrid sea. We came not close on him, for he is stronger than we without the sword. But it seemed he was distilling drops of an oil from certain substances, large, thickened drops that dropped into a phial. Then Shibli Bagarag said, The season of weakness with me is over, and they that confide in my strength, my cunning, my watchfulness, my wielding of the sword, have naught to fear for themselves. Now this is my plot, O Feshnavat, that part of it in which thou art to have a share. Tis that thou depart forthwith to the city yonder, and enter thy palace by a back entrance, and I will see that thou art joined within an hour of thy arrival there by Baba Mustafa, my uncle the gabbler. He is there as I guess by signs. I have had warnings of him. Discover him speedily. Thy task is then to induce him to make an attempt on the head of Shagpat in all wiliness, as he and thou think well to devise. He will fail as I know. But what is that saying of the poet? Persist. If thou wouldst truly reach thine ends, for failures oft are but advising friends. And he says, Every failure is a step advanced, to him who will consider how it chanced. Wherefore will I that this attempt be made, keeping the counsel that is mine, thou must tell Baba Mustafa, I wait without the city, to reward him by my powers of reward, with all that he best loveth. 
So, when he has failed in his attempt on Shagpat, and blows fall plenteously upon him, and he is regaled with the accustomed thwacking, as I have tasted it in this undertaking, do thou waste no further word on him, for his part is over. And as is said, waste not a word in enterprise, against or for the minute flies. Tis then for thee, O Feshnavat, to speed to the presence of the king in his majesty, and thou wilt find means of coming to him by a disguise. Once in the hall of council, challenge the tongue of contradiction to affirm Shagpat other than a bald pate bewigged. This is for thee to do. Quote Feshnavat plaintively after thought, And what becometh of me, O thou master of the event? Shibli Bagarag said, The clutch of the executioner will be upon thee, O Feshnavat, and a clamouring multitude around. Short breathing time given thee, O father of Noorna, ere the time of breathing is commanded to cease. Now, in that respite, the thing that will occur, tis for thee to see and mark. Sure, never will the reverse of things be more complete, and the other side of the picture more rapidly exhibited. If all go as I conceive and plot, and the trap be not premature nor too perfect for the trappers, as the poet has declared, ye that intrigue, to thy slaves proper portions adapt. Perfectest plot burst too often, for all are not apt. And I witness likewise to the excellence of his saying, To master an event, study men. The minutes are well spent only then. Also tis he that says, The man of men who knoweth men, the man of men is he. His army is the human race, and every foe must flee. So have I appointed to thee thy work, to Baba Mustafa his reserving to myself the work that is mine. Thereat, Feshnavat exclaimed, O master of the event, may I be thy sacrifice, on my head be it, and for thee to command is for me to obey. But surely this sword of thine that is in thy girdle, the marvellous blade, tis alone equal to the project and the shave, and the matter might be consummated, the great thing done even from this point whence we behold Shagpat visible, as twere brought forth toward us by the beams. And this sword swayed by thee, and with thy skill and strength, and the hardihood of hand that is thine, Wullahi, twould share him now, this moment, taking the light of a cliss for a lather. Shibli Bagarag knotted the brows of impatience, crying, Hast thou forgotten Karaz in thy calculations? I know of a surety what this sword will do, and I wot the oil he distilleth strengthened Shagpat, but against common blades. Yet shall it not be spoken of me, Shibli Bagarag, that I was tripped by my own conceit, the poet counselleth, when for any mighty end thou hast the aid of heaven. Mount until thy strength shall match those great means which are given. Nor that I was overthrown in despising mine enemy, forgetful of the saying of the sage, Read the features of thy foe, wherever he may find thee. Small he is, seen face to face, but thrice his size behind thee. Wullahi, this Karaz is a genie of craft and resources, one of a mighty stock, and I must close with Shakpat to be sure of him, and that I am not deceived by semblances, opposing guile with guile, and guile deeper than his, for that he awaited it not, thinking I have leapt in fancy beyond the event, and am puffed by the after-breaths of adulation. I, thinking I pluck the blossoms in my hunger for the fruit, that I eat the chick of the yet unlaid egg, O Feshnavat, as is said, and the warrior beareth witness to the wisdom of it, his weapon I'll study, my own conceal. So with two arms to his one I shall deal. The same also testifieth, tis folly of the hero, though resistless in the field, to stake the victory on his steel and fling away the shield. And likewise, examine thine armour in every joint, for slain was the giant, and by a pin's point. Wah! Tis certain there will need subtlety in this undertaking, and a plot plotted, so do thou my bidding, and fail not in the part assigned to thee. Now Feshnavat was persuaded by his words, and cried, In diligence, discretion, and the virtues which characterize subordinates I go, and I delay not. I will perform the thing required of me, O master of the event. And he repeated in verse, with danger beset, be the path crooked or narrow. Thou art the bow, and I the arrow. Then embraced he his daughter, kissing her on the forehead and the eyes, and tightening the girdle of his robe, departed, 
with the name of Allah on his lips in the direction of the city. So Shibli Bagarag called to him the two genie, and his command was, Soar, ye slaves of the sword, till the range of earth and its mountains and seas and deserts are a cluster in the orb of the eye. Shiraz, conspicuous as a rose among garlands, and the ruby consorted with other gems in a setting. In Shiraz, or the country adjoining, ye will come upon one Baba Mustafa by name, and if he be alone, ye may recognize him by his forlorn look and the hang of his cheeks, his vacancy as of utter abandonment. If in company, twill be the only talker that's he. Seize on him, give him a taste of thin air, and deposit him without speech on the roof of a palace, where ye will see Feshnavat in yonder city. This do ere the shadows of the palm tree by the well in the plain move up the mounds that enclose the fortified parts cried Karaveji Sanvitrabush, to hear is to obey. Up into the sky like two bright balls tossed by jugglers, the two genie shot, and watching them, Noorna B. Noorka said, My life, there is a third wanting, Ravejura, and with aid of the three, earth could have planted no obstruction to thy stroke. But thou wert tempted by the third temptation in Aklis, and left not the hall in triumph, the hall of the duping brides. He answered, That is so, my soul, and the penalty is mine, by which I am made to employ deceits ere I strike. And she said, Tis to the generosity of Gulrevas thou ownst Karavejis and Vitravush, and I think she was generous, seeing thee true to me in love, she that hath sorrows. So he said, What of the sorrows of Gulrevas? Tell me of them. But she said, Nay, O my betrothed, Wouldst thou have this tongue blistered and a consuming spark shot against this bosom? Then he said, Make it clear to me. She put her mouth to his ears, saying, There is a curse on whoso telleth of things in a cliss, and to tattle of the seven and their sister forerunneth wretchedness. Surely he stooped to that fair creature and folded her to his heart, his whole soul heaving to her. And he cried again and again, Shall harm hap to thee through me? By Allah, no. And he closed the privileged arm of the bridegroom around her waist that had the yieldingness of the willow branchlet, the flowingness of the summer sea wave, and seemed as to a melting honey like at the first gentle pressure. She leaned her head shyly on his shoulder, yet confiding in his faithfulness, it was that she was shy of the great bliss in her bosom and was made timid by the fervor of her affection as is sung. Deeper than the source of blushes is the power that makes them start. Up in floods the red stream rushes at one whisper of the heart. And it is sung in words presented to the youth as he surveyed her. O beauty of the bride, O beauty of the bride, her bashful joys like serpents sting her tenderness to tears. Her hopes are sleeping eagles in the shining of the spheres. O beauty of the bride, O beauty of the bride, and she is a lapping antelope that from her image flees, and she is a dove caught in two hands to pant as she shall please. O beauty of the bride, O beauty of the bride, like torrents over paradise her lengthy tresses roll. She moves as though the swaying rose and chids her hasty soul. The thing she will, that will she not, yet can no will control. O beauty, beauty, beauty of the bride. They were thus together, a barak leaning under one wing of Kuruk for shade up on the slope of the hill, and Shibli Bagarak called to him, Ho, a barak, look if there be aught impending over the city. So he arose and looked, crying, One with plunging legs high up in air over the city between two bright bodies. Shibli Bagarak exclaimed, Tis well. The second chapter of the event is opened, so call it thou that tellest of the shaving of Shagpat. It will be the shortest. Then said he, The shadow of yonder palm is now a slanted spear up the looped wall of the city. Now the time of Shagpat's triumph and his greatest majesty will be when yonder walls chase the shadow of the palm up this hill, and then will Baba Mustafa be joining the chorus of creatures that shriek toward even ere they snooze. There's not an ape in the woods, nor hyena in the forest, nor birds on the branches, nor frogs in the marsh that will outnoise 
Baba Mustafa under the thong. Wullahi, twill grieve his soul in after time when he sitteth secure in honours, coated with a thousand years at his bidding, that so much breath scaped him without toll of the tongue. But as the poet says truly, the chariot of events lifteth many dusty heels, and many, high and of renown, it crusheth with its wheels. Wah, I have had my share of the thong, and am I, master of the event, to be squeamish in attaining an end by its means? Nay, by the sword. Thereat he strode once again to the summit of the hill, and in a moment the genie fronted him like two short arrows quivering from the flight. So he cried, It is done? They answered, In faithfulness. So he beckoned to Noorna, and she came forward swiftly to him, exclaiming, I read the plot and the thing required of me, so say not, but embrace me ere I leave thee, my betrothed, my master. He embraced her and led her to where the genie stood. Then said he to the genie, Convey her to the city, O ye slaves of the sword, and watch over her there. If ye let but an evil wind ruffle the hair of her head, lo, I sever ye with a stroke that shaketh the underworlds. Remain by her till the shrieks of Baba Mustafa greet ye, and then will follow commotion among the crowd and cries for Shakpat to show himself to the people. Cries also of death to Feshnavat, and there will be an assembly in the king's hall of justice. Thither lead ye my betrothed and watch over her. And he said to Noorna, Thou knowest my design. So she said, When condemnation is passed on Feshnavat, that I appear in the hall as bride of Shakpat, and so rescue him, that is my father. And she cried, O oh, fair delightful time that is coming, my happiness and thy honour on earth dateth from it. Farewell, O oh my betrothed, beloved youth. Eyes of mine, these genie will be by, and there's no cause for fear or sorrow, and tis for thee to look like morning that speeds the march of light. Thou, my betrothed, Art thou not all that enslaveth the heart of a woman? cried Shibli Bagarag. And thou, O Noorna, all that enraptured the soul of man, Allah keep thee my life. Lo, while they were wasting the rich love in their hearts, the genie rose up with Noorna, and she, waving her hand to him, was soon distant and as the white breast of a bird turned to the sun. Then went he to where Barak was leaning, and summoned Kuruk, and the twain mounted him, and rose up high over the city of Shagbat to watch the ripening of the event as a vulture watcheth over the desert. End of chapter 20 Recording by Gabriel Glenn Section 27 of The Shaving of Shag Pat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith, Chapter 21, Part 1. The Dish of Pomegranate Grain. Now, in the city of Shagpat, Kadza, spouse of Shagpat, she that had belabored Shibli Bagarag, had a dream while these things were doing, and it was a dream of danger and portent to the glory of her eyes, Shagpat. So, at the hour when he was revealed to Shibli Bagarag, made luminous by the beams of Aklis, Kadza went to an inner chamber, and greased her hands and her eyelids, and drank of a phial, and commenced tugging at a brass ring fixed in the floor, and it yielded and displayed an opening, over which she stooped the upper half of her leanness, and pitching her note high, called, Keras! After that, she rose and retreated from the hole hastily, and in the winking of an eye it was filled, as twere a pillar of black smoke, by the body of the genie, he breathing hard with mighty travel. So he cried to her between his pantings and puffings, Speak, where am I wanted, and for what? Now Kadza was affrighted at the terribleness of his manner, and the great smell of the genie was an intoxication in her nostril, so that she reeled and could just falter out, Danger to the identical! Then he, in a voice like claps of thunder, Out with it! She answered beseechingly, Tis a dream I had, O genie, a dream of danger to him. 
While she spake, the genie clenched his fists, and stamped so that the palace shook and the earth under it, exclaiming, O oh, abominable Kadza! A dream, is it? Another dream? Wilt thou cease dreaming a while, thou silly woman? Know I not he that's powerful against us is an Aklis, crowned ape, and that his spells are gone? and I was distilling drops to defy the sword and strengthen Shagpat from assault, yet bringest thou me from my labour by the putrid sea with thy accursed dream. Thereat he frowned and shot fire at her from his eyes, so that she singed, and the room thickened with a horrible smell of burning. She feared greatly and trembled, but he cooled himself against the air, crying presently in a diminished voice, let's hear this dream thou foolish kadza tis as well to hear it probably rabesquerat hath sent thee some sign from aklis where she ferrieth a term what's that saying a woman's at the core of every plot man plotteth and like an ill-reared fruit first at the core it rotteth so out with it thou kadza now the urgency of that she had dreamed overcame fear in kadza and she said O oh, great genie and terrible, my dream was this. Lo, I saw an assemblage of the beasts of the forests, and them that inhabit wild places. And there was the elephant, and the rhinoceros, and the hippopotamus, and the camel, and the camelopard, and the serpent, and the striped tiger, also the antelope, the hyena, the jackal, and above them, eminent in majesty, the lion. Surely he sat as twere on a high seat, and they like suppliants thronging the presence. This I saw, the heart on my ribs beating for Shagpat. And there appeared among the beasts a monkey all adjoint with tricks, jerking with malice, he looking as t'were hungry for the doing of things detestable. And the lion scorned him, and I marked him ridicule the lion. T'was so. And the lion began to scowl, and the other beasts marked the displeasure of the lion. Then chased they that monkey from the presence, and for a while he was absent, and the lion sat in his place gravely, with calm, receiving homage of the other beasts. And down to his feet came the eagle that's lord of air, and before him kneeled the great elephant, and the subtle serpent eyed him with awe. But soon did that monkey, the wretched animal, reappear, and there was no peace for the lion, he worrying till close within stretch of the lion's paw. Wah! The lion might have crushed him, but that he's magnanimous. And so it was that as the monkey advanced, the lion roared to him, Be gone! And the monkey cried, Who commandeth? So the lion roared, The king of beasts and thy king. Then that monkey cried, Homage to the king of beasts and my king, Allah keep him in his seat, and I would he were visible. So the lion roared, He sitteth here acknowledged, thou graceless animal, and he's before thee apparent. Then the monkey affected eagerness, and gazed about him, and peered on this beast and on that, exclaiming like one that's injured and under slight, What's this I've done, and wherein have I offended, that he should be hidden from me when pointed out? So the lion roared, "'Tis where I sit, thou offensive monkey. "'Then that monkey in the upper pitch of amazement, "'Thou, is it for created thing to acknowledge a king without a tail? "'And, O beasts of the forest and the wilderness, how say ye? "'Am I to blame that I bow not to one that hath it not?' "'Upon that the lion rose and roared in the extreme of his wrath, "'but the word he was about to utter was checked in him.' for twas manifest that where he would have lashed a tail he shook a stump, wagging it as the dog doth. Lo, when the lion saw that, his majesty melted from him, and in a moment the plumpness of content and prosperity forsook him, so that his tawny skin hung flabbily and his jaw drooped, and shame deprived him of stateliness. Abashed was he." Now, seeing the lion ashamed in this manner, my heart beat violently for Shagpat, so that I awoke with the strength of its beating, and twas hidden from me whether the monkey was punished by the lion, or exalted by the other beasts in his place, or how came it that the lion's tail was lost, witched from him by that villain of mischief, the monkey. 
but o oh great genie i knew there was a lion among men reverenced and with enemies that lion he that espoused me and my glory shagpat twas enough to know that and tremble at the omen of my dream o oh genie wherefore i thought it well to summon thee here that thou mightest set a guard over shagpat and shield him from the treacheries that beset him when kadza had ceased speaking the genie glowered at her a while in silence then said he what creature is that kadza which tormenteth like the tongue of a woman is small as her pretensions to virtue and which showeth how the chapters of her history should be read by the holy ones even in its manner of movement cried kadza the flea that hoppeth so he said tis well hast thou strength to carry one of my weight o kadza she answered in squeamishness ay wallahi i'm but a woman genie though the wife of shagpat and to carry thee is for the camel and the elephant and the horse then he tighten thy girdle and when tightened let a loose hoop hang from it she did that and he gave her a dark powder in her hand saying swallow the half of this and what remaineth mix with water and sprinkle over thee that did she and thereupon he exclaimed now go and thy part is to move round shagpat and a wind will strike thee from one quarter and from which quarter it striketh is the one of menace and danger to shagpat so kadza was diligent in doing what the genie commanded and sought for shagpat and moved round him many times but no wind struck her she went back to the genie and told him of this and the genie cried what no wind not one from aklis then will shagpat of a surety triumph and we with him now there was joy on the features of kadza and karaz till suddenly he said halt in thy song how if there be danger and menace above and tis the thing that may be then he seized kadza and slung her by him and went into the air and up it till the roofs of the city of shagpat were beneath their feet all on them visible and under an awning on the roof of the palace there was the vizier feshnavat and baba mustapha they ear to lip in consultation and baba mustapha brightening with the matter revealed to him and bobbing his head and breaking on the speech of the vizier now when he saw them the genie blew from his nostrils a double stream of darkness which curled in a thick body round and round him and kadza slung at his side was enveloped in it as with folds of a huge serpent then the genie hung still and lo two radiant figures swept toward the roof he watched and between them noorna bin noorka her long hair borne far backward and her robe of silken stuff fluttering and straining on the pearl buttons as she flew there was that in her beauty and the silver clearness of her temples and her eyes and her cheeks and her neck and chin and ankles that made the genie shudder with love of her and he was nigh dropping kadza to the ground forgetful of all save noorna when he recovered and it was by tightening his muscles till he was all over hard knots noorna was seated on a cushion and descending he heard her speak his name then sniffed he the air and said to kadza o spouse of shagpat a plot breweth and the odour of it is in my nostril fearest thou a scorching for his sake thou adorest the miracle of men she answered on my head be it and my eyes he said i shall alight thee behind the pole of awning on yonder roof where are the two bright figures and the dingy one and the vizier shevnavat and noorna bin noorka a flame will spring up severing thee from them but thou art secure from it by reason of the powder i gave thee all save the hair that's on thee thou wilt have another shape than that which is thine even that of a slave of noorna bin noorka and say to her when she asketh thy business with her o oh my mistress let the storm gather in the storm-bird when it would surprise men do this and thy part's done o kadza thereupon he swung a circle and alighted her behind the pole of awning on the roof and vanished and the circle of flame rose up and kadza passed through it slightly scorched and answered to the question of noorna 
oh my mistress let the storm gather in the storm bird when it would surprise men now when noorna beheld her and heard her voice she pierced the disguise and was ware of the wife of shagpat and glanced her large eyes over kadza from head to sole till they rested on the loose loop in her girdle seeing that she rose up and stretched her arms and spread open the palm of her hand and slapped kadza on the cheek and ear a hard slap so that she heard bells and ere she ceased to hear them another so that kadza staggered back and screamed and feshnevet was moved to exclaim what has the girl thy favourite offended in o my daughter so noorna continued slapping kadza and cried is she not sluttish and where's the point of decency established in her this lulo shall her like appear before thee and me with loose girdle then she pointed to the girdle and kadza tightened the loose loop and fell upon the ground to avoid the slaps and noorna knelt by her and clutched at a portion of her dress and examined it peering intently and she caught up another part and knotted it as if to crush a living creature hunting over her and grasping at her and so it was that while she tore strips from the garment of kadza feshnevet jumped suddenly in wrath and pinched over his garments crying tis unbearable tis i know not what other than a flea that persecuteth me upon that noorna ran to him and while they searched together for the flea baba mustapha fidgeted and worried in his seat lurching to the right and to the left muttering curses and it was evident he too was persecuted and there was no peace on the roof of that palace but pinching and howling and stretching of limbs and curses snarled in the throat and imprecations on the head of the tormenting flea surely the soul of kadza rejoiced for she knew the flea was Keraz, whom she had brought with her in the loose loop of her girdle through the circle of flame which was a barrier against him she glistened at the triumph of the flea but noorna strode to her and took her to the side of the roof and pitched her down it and closed the passage to her then ran she to Keravegis and vidravush whispering in the ear of each no word of the sword and afterward aloud what think ye will be the term of the staying of my betrothed in Aklis, crowned ape they answered o pearl of the morn crowned ape till such a time as shagpat be shaved so she beat her breast crying o utter stagnation till shagpat be shaved and o oh, stoppage on the tide of business dense cloud upon the face of beauty and frost on the river of events till shagpat be shaved and o oh, my betrothed crowned ape in Aklis, till shagpat be shaved then she lifted her hands and arms and said to him where he is ye genii and away for he needeth comfort thereat the glittering spirits dissolved and thinned and were as taper gleams of curved light across the water in their ascent of the heavens when they were gone noorna exclaimed now for the dish of pomegranate grain o baba mustapha and let nothing delay us further quoth baba mustapha tis ordered o my princess and fair mistress from the confectioners and with it the sleepy drug from the seller of medicaments a cursed flea now she laughed and said what am i o baba mustapha so he said not thou o bright shooter of beams but i wallahi i'm but a bundle of points through the pertinacity of this flea a house of irritabilities a mere mass of fretfulness and i've no thought but for the chasing of this unlucky flea was never flea like it in the world before this flea and tis a flea to anger the holy ones and make the saintly dervish swear at such a flea he wriggled and curled where he sat and noorna cried what shall we be defeated by a flea we that would shave shagpat and release this city and the world from bondage and she looked up to the sky that was then without a cloud blazing with the sun on his mid-seat and exclaimed o star of shagpat wilt thou constantly be in the ascendant and defeat us the liberators of men with a flea now whenever one of the twain baba mustapha and the vizier shefnavet commenced speaking of the dish of pomegranate grain the torment of the flea took all tongue from him 
and was destruction to the gravity of counsel and deliberation. The dish of pomegranate grain was brought to them by slaves, and the drug to induce sleep, yet neither could say aught concerning it, they were as jointy grasshoppers through the action of the flea, and the torment of the flea became a madness, they shrieking, "'Tis now with thee, tis now with me, fires of the damned on this flea." In their extremity they called to Allah for help, but no help came, save when they abandoned all speech concerning the dish of pomegranate grain. Then were they for a moment eased of the flea. So Nurna recognized the presence of her enemy Keraz, and his malicious working, and she went and fetched a jar brimmed with water for the bath, and stirred it with her forefinger, and drew on it a flame from the rays of the sun, till there rose up from the jar a white thick smoke. She rustled her raiment, making the wind of it collect round Baba Mustafa and Feshnavat, and did this till the sweat streamed from their brows and bodies, and they were sensible of peace and the absence of the flea. Then she whisked away the smoke, and they were attended by slaves with fresh robes, and were as new men, and sat together over the dish of pomegranate grain, praising the wisdom of Nurna and her power. Then Baba Mustafa revived in briskness, and cried, Here's the dish, and tis in my hands an instrument, an instrument of vengeance, and one to endow the skilful wielder of it with glory. And tis as I designed it, sweet, seasoned, savoury, a flattery to the eye, and no deceiver to the palate. Wah, and such an instrument in the hands of the discerning and the dexterous, and the discreet and the judicious, and them gifted with determination, is it not such as sufficeth for the overturning of empires and systems, O my mistress, fair one, sapphire of the city? And is it not written that I shall beguile Shagpat by its means, and master the event, and shame the king of Ulb and his court? And I shall then sit in state among men, and surround myself with adornments and with slaves, mute, that talk not save at the signal, and are as statues round the cushions of their lord, that's myself. And I shall surround myself with the flatteries of wealth, and walk bewildered in silks and stuff and perfumeries, and sweet young beauties shall I have about me, antelopes of grace as I like them, and select them, long-eyed, lazy, fond of listening, and with bashful looks that timidly admire the dignity that's in man." While he was pratting, Noorna took the dish in her lap, and folded her silvery feet beneath her, and commenced whipping into it the drug. And she whipped it dexterously and with equal division among the grain, whipping it and the flea with it, but she feigned not to mark the flea, and whipped harder. Then took she colour, and coloured it saffron, and laid over it gold leaf, so that it glittered and was an enticing sight, and the dish was of gold, crusted over with devices and patterns, and heads of golden monsters, a ravishment of skill in him that executed it, cumbrous with ornate golden workmanship. Likewise there were places round the dish for sticks of perfume, and cups carved for the storing of perfumed pellets, and into these Nurna put myrrh and ambergris, and rich incenses, aloes, sandalwood, prepared essences, divers keen and sweet scents. Then when all was in readiness, she put the dish upon the knee of Babu Mustafa, and awoke him from his babbling reverie with a shout, and said, An instrument verily, O Baba Mustafa, and art thou a cat to shave Shagpat with that tongue of thine? Now he arose and made a sign of obedience, and said, Tis well, O lady of grace and bright wit, and now for the cap of Shiraz and the Persian robe, and my twenty slaves and seven to follow me to the mansion of Shagpat. I'll do, I'll act. So she motioned to a slave to bring the cap of Shiraz and the Persian robe, and in these Baba Mustafa arrayed himself. Then called he for the twenty and seven slaves, and they were ranged, some to go before, some to follow him. And he was exalted, and made the cap of Shiraz nod in his conceit, crying, Am I not leader in this complot? Wallahi! All bow to me and acknowledge it. Then to check himself, he called out sternly to the slaves, Ho ye, forward to the mansion of Shagpat, and pass at a slow pace through the streets of the city, solemnly, gravely, as before a potentate. 
then will the people inquire of ye who it is ye marshal and what mighty one and ye will answer he's from the court of shiraz nothing less than a vizier bearing homage to shagpat even this dish of pomegranate grain so they said to hear is to obey end of part 1 of chapter 21section 28 of the shaving of shagpat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the shaving of shagpat by george meredith chapter 21 part 2 upon that he waved his hand and stalked majestically and they descended from the roof into the street criers running in front to clear the way when baba mustapha was hidden from view by a corner of the street noorna shrank in her white shoulders and laughed and was like a flashing pearl as she swayed and dimpled with laughter and she cried true are those words of the poet and i testify to them in the instance of baba mustapha with feathers of the cock i'll fashion a vain creature with feathers of the owl i'll make a judge in feature is not the barber elate and lofty he goeth forth to the mastery of this event as go many armed with naught other than their own conceit and tis written fools from their fate seek not to urge the coxcomb carrieth his scourge so feshnavit smoothed his face and said is it not also written oft may the fall of fools make wise men moan too often hangs the house on one loose stone tis so o noorna my daughter and i am as a reed shaken by the wind of apprehensiveness and doubt in me is a deep root as to the issue of this undertaking for the wrath of the king will be terrible and the clamour of the people soundeth in my ears already if shibli bagarag fail in one stroke where be we tis certain i know not the might in shagpat when i strove with him and he's powerful beyond the measure of man's subtlety and yonder flies a rook without fellow an omen and all's ominous and ominous of ill and i marked among the troop of slaves that preceded baba mustapha one that squinted and that's an omen and o oh my daughter i counsel that thou by thy magic speed us to some remote point in the caucasus where we may abide the unravelling of this web securely one way or the other way tis my counsel o noorna then she abandon my betrothed and betray him on the very stroke of the sword and diminish him by a withdrawal of that faith in his right wrist which strengthen it more than caravegis and vidravouche wound round it in coils and she leaned her head and cried hark hearest thou there's shouting in the streets of shiraz and of shagpat shall we merit the punishment of shaphash the persian on kepil the builder while the event is mastering i'll mark this interview between babu mustapha and shagpat and do thou o oh my father rest here on this roof till the king's guard of horsemen and soldiers of the law come hither for thee and go with them sedately fearing not for i shall be by thee in the garb of an old woman and preserve thy composure in the presence of the king and shagpat exalted and allow not the thing that happeneth let fly from thee the shaft of speech but remain a slackened bow till the strength of my betrothed is testified fearing not for fear is that which defeateth men and tis declared in a distich the strongest weapon one can see in mortal hands is constancy and for thee to flee now would rank us with that king described by the poet a king of eind there was who fought a fight from the first gleam of morn till fall of night but when the royal tent his generals sought proclaiming victory fled was he who fought despair possessed them till they chanced to spy a dervish that paced on with downward eye they questioned of the king he answered slow ye fought but one the king a double foe and o oh, my father they interpreted of this that the king had been vanquished and that he was victor by the phantom army of his fears 
Now the vizier cried, Be the will of Allah achieved and consummated. And he was silenced by her wisdom and urgency, and sat where he was, diverting not the arch on his brow from its settled furrow. He was as one that thirsteth, and whose eye hath marked a snake of swift poison by the water, so thirsted he for the event, yet hung with dread from advancing. But Nurna bin Nurka busied herself about the roof, drawing circles to witness the track of an enemy, and she clapped her hands and cried, Lalu! And lo, a fair slave girl that came to her and stood by with bent head, like a white lily by a milk-white antelope. So Nurna clouded her brow a moment, and when the moon darkeneth behind a scud, and cried, Speak, art thou in league with Karaz, girl? Lolu strained her hands to her temples, exclaiming, With the terrible genie, I, in league with him? My mistress, surely the charms I wear, and the amulets, I wear them as a protection from that genie, and a safeguard, he that carrieth off the maidens and the young sucklings, walking under the curse of mothers. Said Nurna, O oh, Lalu, have I boxed those little ears of thine this day? The fair slave girl smiled a smile of submissive tenderness, and answered, Not this day, nor once since Lalu was rescued from the wicked old merchant by thy overbidding, and was taken to the arms of a wise kind sister, wiser and kinder than any she had been stolen from, she that is thy slave for ever. She said this weeping, and Nurna mused, "'Twas as I divined that wretched Kadza, her griefs to come. Then spake she aloud as to herself, "'Knew I, or could one know, I should this day be a bride?' And hearing that, Lalu shrieked, "'Thou a bride, and torn from me, and we two parted? And I, a poor drooping tendril, left to wither? For my life is round thee, and worthless away from thee, O cherisher of the fallen flower!' and she sobbed out wailful verses and words, broken and without a meaning. But Nurna caught her by the arm and swung her, and bade her fetch on the instant a robe of blue, and pile in her chamber robes of amber and saffron and grey, bridal robes of many-lighted silks, plum-coloured, peach-coloured, of the colour of musk mixed with pale gold, together with bridal ornaments and veils of the bride, and a jewelled circlet for the brow. When this was done, Nurna went with Lalu to her chamber, attended by slave girls, and arrayed herself in the first dress of blue, and swayed herself before the mirror, and rattled the gold pieces in her hair and on her neck with laughter. And Lalu was bewildered, and forgot her tears to watch the gaiety of her mistress. And lo! Nurna made her woman take off one set of ornaments with every dress, and with every dress she put on another set and after she had gone the round of the different dresses, she went to the bathroom with Lalu, and at her bidding, Lalu entered the bath beside Nurna, and the twain dipped and shouldered in the blue water, and were as when a single star is by the full moon on a bright midnight, pouring luster about. And Nurna splashed Lalu and said, This night we shall not sleep together, O Lalu, nor lie close, thy bosom on mine. Thereat Lalu wept afresh and cried, Ah, cruel, and tis a sweet thought for thee, and thou'lt have no mind for me, tossing on my hateful lonely couch. Tenderly Nurna eyed Lalu, and the sprinkles of the bath fell with the tears of both, and they clung together, and were like the lily and its bud on one stalk in a shower. Then, when Nurna had spent her affection, she said, O thou of the long downward lashes, thy love is constant when I stood under a curse and was an old woman, a hag. Carest thou so little to learn the name of him that claimeth me? Lalu replied, I thought of no one save myself and my loss, O my lost pearl. Happy is he, a youth of favor. O oh, how I shall hate him that taketh thee from me. Tell me now his name, O sovereign of hearts. So Nurna smoothed the curves and corners of her mouth, and calmed her countenance, crying in a deep tone and a voices of reverence, Shagpat. Now at that name Lalu drank in her breath and was awed, and sank in herself, and had just words to ask, 
hath he demanded thee again in marriage o oh my mistress said noorna even so lalu muttered great is the dispenser of our fates and she spake no further but sighed and took napkins and summoned the slave girls and arrayed noorna silently in the robe of blue and bridal ornaments then noorna said to them that thronged about her put on each of ye a robe of white ye that are maidens and a fillet of blue and a sash of saffron and abide my coming and she said to lalu array thyself in a robe of blue even as mine and let trinkets lurk in thy tresses and abide my coming then went she forth from them and veiled her head and swathed her figure in raiment of a coarse white stuff and was as the moon going behind a hill of dusky snow and she left the house and passed along the streets and by the palaces till she came to the palace of her father now filled by shagpat before the palace grouped a great concourse and a multitude of all ages of either sex in that city despite the blaze and the heat like roaring of a sea beyond the mountains was the noise that issued from them and their eyes were a fire of beams against the portal of the palace now she saw in the crowd one shafrak a shoemaker and addressed him saying o shafrak the shoemaker what's this assembly and how got together for the poet says ye string not such assemblies in the street save when some high event should be complete he answered tis an event complete wallahi the deputation from shiraz to shagpat and the submission of that vain city to the might of shagpat and he asked her jestingly art thou a witch to guess that o veiled and virtuous one quoth she i read the thing that cometh ere tis come and i read danger to shagpat in this deputation from shiraz and this dish of pomegranate grain so shafrak cried by the beard of my father's and that of shagpat let's speak of this to zeal the garlic seller he broadened to one that was by him and said o zeal what's thy mind here's a woman a wise woman a witch and she sees danger to shagpat in this deputation from shiraz and this dish of pomegranate grain now zeal screwed his visage and gazed up to his forehead and said twere best to consult with bootleback the drum-beater the two then called to bootleback the drum-beater and told him the matter and bootleback pondered and tapped his brow and beat on his stomach and said cruz el karazawik the carrier is good in such a case now from cruz el karazawik the carrier they went to dab the confectioner and from dab the confectioner to azawul the builder and from azawul the builder to cheek the collector of taxes and each referred to some other till perplexity triumphed and was a cloud over them and the words danger to shagpat went about like bees and were canvassing when suddenly a shrill voice rose from the midst dominating other voices and it was that of kadza and she cried who talks here of danger to shagpat and what wretch is it now cheek pointed out as a wool and as a wool dub and dub cruzel krasawick and he bootleback and the drum-beater shrugged his shoulder at zeal and zeal stood away from shafrak and shafrak seized noorna and shouted tis she this woman the witch kadz affronted noorna and called to her o oh, thing of infamy what's this talk of thine concerning danger to our glory shagpat then noorna replied i say it o kadza and i say it there's danger threateneth him and from that deputation and that dish of pomegranate grain now kadza laughed a loose laugh and jeered at noorna crying danger to shagpat he that's attended by genii and watched over by the greatest of them day and night incessantly and noorna said i ask pardon of the power that seeth and of thee if i be wrong wah am i not also of them that watch over shagpat so then let thou and i go into the palace and examine the doings of this deputation and this dish of pomegranate grain now kadza remembered the scene on the roofs of the vizier shefnavet and relaxed in her look of suspicion and said tis well let's in to them 
whereupon the twain threaded through the crowd and locked at the portals of the palace, and it was opened to them, and they entered. And lo, the hand that opened the portals was the hand of a slave of the sword, and against corners of the court leaned slaves silly with slumber. So Kadza went up to them and beat them and shook them, and they yawned and mumbled, Excellent grain, good grain, the grain of Shiraz. And she beat them with what might was hers, till some fell sideways and some forward, still mumbling, Excellent pomegranate grain. Kadza was beside herself with anger and vexation at them, tearing them and cuffing them. But Noorna cried, O Kadza, what said I? There's danger to Shagpat in this dish of pomegranate grain. And what's that saying? Tis much against the master's wish that slaves too greatly praise his dish. Wallahi, I like not this talk of the grain of Shiraz. Now while Noorna spake, the eyes of Kadza became like those of the starved wild cat, and she sprang off and along the marble of the court, and clawed a passage through the air, and past the marble pillars of the palace toward the first room of reception, Noorna following her. And in the first room were slaves leaning and lolling like them about the court, and in the second room and in the third room, silent all of them and senseless. So at this sight the spark of suspicion became a mighty flame in the bosom of Kadza, and horror burst out at all ends of her, and she shuddered and cried, What for us, and where's our hope if Shagpat be shorn, and he lopped of the identical, shamed like the lion of my dream? And Noorna clasped her hands and said, Tis that I fear, seek for him, O Kadza. So Kadza ran to a window, and looked forth over the garden of the palace, and it was a fair garden, with the gleam of a fountain, and watered plants, and cool arches of shade, thick bowers, fragrant alleys, long-sheltered terraces, and beyond the garden a summer-house of marble fanned by the broad leaves of a palm. Now when Kadza had gazed a moment, she shrieked, "'He's there! Shake Pat! Giveth he not the light of a jewel to the house that holdeth him?' Awah he, and he's witched there for an ill purpose. Then tore she from that room like a mad wild thing after its stolen cubs, and sped along corridors of the palace, and down the great flight of steps into the garden, and across the garden, knocking over the ablution pots in her haste, and Norna had just strength to withhold her from dashing through the doors of the summer-house to come upon Shagpat, she straining and crying, He's there, I say, O oh wise woman, Shagpat, let's into him. But Noorna clung to her and spake in her ear, Wilt thou blow the fire that menaces him, O Kadza? And what are two women against the assailants of such a mighty one as he? Then said she, Watch rather, and avail thyself of yonder window by the blue-painted pillar. So Kadza crept up to the blue-painted pillar, which was on the right side of the porch, and the twain peered through the window. Noorna beheld the dish of pomegranate grain, and it was on the floor, empty of the grain, and Babu Mustafa was by it alone making a lather, and he was twitching his mouth and his legs, and flinging about his arms, and Noorna heard him mutter wrathfully, "'Oh, accursed flea! Art thou at me again?' And she heard him mutter as in anguish, "'No peace for thee, O pertinacious flea!' and my steadiness of hand will be gone, now when I have him safe as the hawk, his prey, mine enemy, this shagpat that abused me, thou abominable flea, and, O oh, thou flea, wilt thou, vile thing, hinder me from mastering the event, and releasing this people from the world of enchantment and bondage? And shall I fail to become famous to the ages and the times, because of such as thee, flea? So Kadza whispered to Noorna, What's that he's muttering? Is it of Shagpat? For I mark him not here, nor the light by which he's girt. She answered, Listen with the ear and the eye and all the senses. Now presently they heard Baba Mustafa say in a louder tone, like one that is secure from interruption, Two lathers, and this the third, a potent lather and I wot there's not a hair in this world resisteth the sweep of my blade over such a lather as, ah, flea of iniquity and abomination! What, am I doomed to thy torments? 
So, let's spread. Lo, this lather, is it not the pride of Shiraz? And the polish and smoothness it sheddeth, is it not roseate? My invention, as the poet says, Oh, a cursed flea! Now the knee joint, now the knee cap, and tis but a hop for thee to the armpit. Fires of the pit without bottom seize thee. Is no place sacred from thee, and art thou a restless soul, infernal flea? So then peace awhile, and here's for the third lather. While he was speaking, Baba Mustafa advanced to a large white object that sat motionless, upright like a snow mound on a throne of cushions, and commenced lathering. When she saw that, Kadza tossed up her head and her throat, and a shriek was coming from her, for she was ware of Shagpat. But Noorna stifled the shriek and clutched her fast, whispering, He's safe if thou have but patience, thou silly Kadza, and the flea will defeat this fellow if thou spoil it not. So Kadza said, looking up, Is it seen of Allah, and be the genii still in their depths? But she constrained herself, peering and perking out her chin, and lifting one foot and the other foot, as on furnaces of fire, in the excess of the fury she smothered. And lo, Baba Mustafa worked diligently, and Shagpat was behind an exulting lather, even as one pelted with wheat and flower balls, or balls of powdery perfume, and his hairiness was as branches of the forest foliage, bent under a sudden fall of overwhelming snow, that filleth the pits, and sharpeneth the wolves with hunger, and teacheth new cunning to the fox. A fox was Baba Mustafa in his stratagems, and a wolf in the fierceness of his setting upon Shagpat. Surely he drew forth the blade that was to shear Shagpat, and made with it in the air a preparatory sweep and flourish, and the blade frolicked and sent forth a light, and seemed eager for Shagpat. So Baba Mustafa addressed his arm to the shearing, and inclined gently the edge of the blade, and they marked him let it slide twice to a level with the head of Shagpat, and at the third time it touched, and Kadza howled, but from Baba Mustafa there burst a howl to madden the beasts, and he flung up his blade, and wrenched open his robe, crying, a flea was it to bite in that fashion? Now I swear by the merciful, a fang like that's come into tigers and hyenas and ferocious animals. Then looked he for the mark of the bite, plaining of its pang, and he could find the mark nowhere. So as he caressed himself, eyeing Shagpat sheepishly and with gathering awe, Nurna said hurriedly to Kadza, Away now, and call them in, the crowd about the palace, that they may behold the triumph of Shagpat, for tis ripe, O Kadza. And Kadza replied, Thou art a wise woman, and I'll have thee richly rewarded. Lo, I'm as a camel lightened of fifty loads, and the glory of Shagpat see I as a new sun rising in the desert. Wallahi, thou art wise, and I'll do thy bidding. Now she went flying back to the palace, and called shrill calls to the crowd, and collected them in the palace, and headed them through the garden, and it was when Baba Mustafa had summoned the courage for a second essay, and was in the act of standing over Shagpat to operate on him, that the crowd burst the doors, and he was quickly seized by them, and tugged at, and hauled at, and pummeled, and torn and vituperated, and as a wrecked vessel on stormy waters, plunging up and down with tattered sails, when the crew fling overboard freight and ballast and provision. Surely his time would have been short with that mob, but Nurna made Kadza see the use of examining him before the king, and there were in that mob sheiks and fakirs, holy men who listened to the words of Kadza, and exerted themselves to rescue Baba Mustafa, and quieted the rage that was prevailing, and bore Baba Mustafa with them to the great palace of the king, which was in the centre of that city. Now, when the king heard of the attempt on Shagpat, and the affair of the pomegranate grain, he gave orders for the admission of the people, as many of them as could be contained in the hall of justice. And he set a guard over Baba Mustafa, and commanded that Shagpat should be brought to the palace, even as he then was, and with the lather on him. So the regal mandate went forth, and Shagpat was brought in state on cushions, and the potency of the drug preserved his sedateness through all this. 
and he remained motionless in sleep, folded in the centre of calm and satisfaction, while this tumult was raging and the city shook with uproar. But the people, when they saw him whitened behind a lather, wrath at Baba Mustafa's polluting touch and the audacity of barbercraft wrestled in them with the outpouring of reverence for Shagpat, and a clamour arose for the instant sacrifice of Baba Mustafa at the foot of their idol Shagpat. And the whole of the city of Shagpat, men, women, and children, and the sheiks and the dervishes and crafts of the city, besieged the king's palace in that middle hour of the noon, clamouring for the sacrifice of Baba Mustafa at the feet of their idol Shagpat. End of chapter 21section twenty nine of the shaving of shagpat this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rick cornwall the shaving of shagpat by george meredith chapter twenty two now the great hall for the dispensing of justice in the palace of the king was one on which the architect and the artificers had lavished all their arts and subtleties of design and taste and their conceptions of uniformity and grandeur so that none entered it without a sense of abasement and the soul acknowledged awfulness and power in him that ruled and sat eminent on the throne of that hall for lo the throne was of solid weighty gold overhung with rich silks and purples and the hall was lofty with massive pillars fifty on either side ranging in stateliness down toward the blaze of the throne, and the pillars were pillars of porphyry and of jasper and precious marble, carven over all of them with sentences of the cunningest wisdom, distexts of excellence, odes of the poet, stanzas sharp with the incisiveness of wit, and that solve knotty points with but one stroke. And these pillars were each the gift of a mighty potentate of earth or of a genie. In the center of the hall a fountain set up a glittering jet, and spread it abroad the breath of freshness, leaping a height of sixty feet, and shimmering there in a wide, bright canopy with dropping silver sides. It was rumored of the waters of this fountain that they were fed underground from the waters of the sacred river, brought there in the reign of El Rasun, a former sovereign in the city of Shagpat, by their laborers of Zak, a genie subject to the magic words of Azruka, the queen of El Rasun, but of a surety, None of earth were like to them in silverness and sweet coolness, and they were as wine to the weary. Now the king sat on his throne in the hall, and around him his ministers, and emirs, and chamberlains, and officers of state, and black slaves, and the soldiers of his guard, armed with naked scimitars. And the king was as a sun in splendor, severely grave, and a frown on his forehead to darken kingdoms, for the attempt on Shagpat had stirred his kingly wrath and awakened zeal for the punishment of all conspirators and offenders. So when Shagpat was borne in to the king upon his throne of cushions, where he sat upright, smiling and inanimate, the king commanded that he should be placed at his side, the place of honor, and Shagpat was as a moon behind the whiteness of the lathers. Even as we behold moon and sun together in the heavens, was Shagpat by the king. There was a great hubbub in the hall at the entrance of Shagpat, and a hum of rage and muttered venomance, passed among the assembled people that filled the hall like a cavern of the sea, the sea roaring outside. But presently the king spake, and all hushed. Then said he, O people, thought I to see a day that would shame Shagpat, he that has brought honor and renown upon me in all of this city, so that we shine a constellation and place of pilgrimage to men in remote islands and corners of the earth? Yea, and to the Aphrites and genii? Have I not castigated barbers, and brought barbercraft to degradation, so that no youth is taught to exercise it? And through me the tackle of the barber is not a rusty and abominated weapon, and as a sword thrown by and broken, for that it dishonored us? Surely, too, I have esteemed Shagpat precious. While he spoke, the king gazed upon Shagpat, and was checked by passion at beholding him under the lather, so that the people praised Shagpat and the king. Then said he, O people, who shall forecast disasters and triumphs? Lo, I had this day at dawn intelligence from recurrent Ulb and its king and court, and of their return to do honor to Shagpat. And I had this day at dawn tidings, O people from Shiraz, 
and of the adhesion of that vain city and its provinces to the might of Shagpat. So commenced the day, yet is he, the object of the world's homage, within a few hours defiled by a lather in the hand of an impious one. At these words of the king there arose a shout of vindictiveness and fury, but he cried, Punishment on the offenders in season, O people! Probably we have not abased ourselves for the honor that has befallen us in Shagpat, and the distinction among nations and tribes and races and creeds and sects that we enjoy because of Shagpat. Behold, in abasement voluntarily undertaken, there is exceeding brightness and exaltation. For how is the sun a sun, save that daily he dippeth in darkness, to rise again freshly majestic? So then be mine the example, O people of the city of Shagpat. Thereupon, lo, the king descended from his throne, and stripped to the loins, flinging away his glittering crown and his robes, and abased himself to the dust with loud cries and importunities and howls, and penitential ejaculations and sobbings. And it was in that hall as when the sun goeth down in the storm. Likewise the ministers of the king, and the visors, and the emirs, and officers of state, and slaves, and soldiers of the guard, bared their limbs, and fell beside the king with violent outcries and wailings, and the whole of the people in the hall prostrated their bodies with wailings and lamentations. And Baba Mustafa feigned to bewail himself, and Nurna bin Nurka knelt beside Kadza, and shrieked loudest, striking her breast and scattering her hair. And that hall was as a pit full of serpents wreathing, and of tigers and lions and wild beasts howling, each pitching his howl a note above his neighbors, so that the tone rose and sank, and there was no one soul erect in that hall save Shagpat, he on his throne of cushions, smiling behind the lathers, inanimate, serene as they that sin not. After an hour's lapse there came a pause, and the people hearkened for the voice of the king, but in the intervals a louder moan would strike their ears and they whispered among themselves, "'Tis that of the faker, El Zoop, and the moaning and howling prevailed again, and again they heard another moan, a deep one, as of the earth in its throes, and said among themselves, "'Tis that of Butbak, the drum-beater.' And this led off to the howl of Arip, the devrish, and this was followed by the shriek of Zeal, the garlic-seller, and the wail of Cruz, El Karazwik, the carrier, and the complainings of Dob, the confectioner, and the groan of Salop, the broker, and the yell of Azawu, the builder. There would have been no end to it known, but the king rose and commenced plucking his beard and his hair, they likewise in silence. When he had performed this ceremony a space, the king called, and a basin of water was brought to him, and handed round by slaves, and all dipped in it their hands, and renewed their countenances, and rearranged their limbs. And the hall brightened with the eye of the king, and he cried, O people, lo, the plot is revealed to me, and tis a deep one. But by this beard we'll strike at the root of it, with a blow of deadliness. Surely we have humiliated ourselves, and vengeance is ours. How say ye? A noise like the first sullen growl of a vexed wild beast, which telleth that fury is fast travelling, and the teeth will flash, followed these words. And the king called to his soldiers of the guard, Ho, forth with this wretch that dared defile Shagpat the Holy One, and on your heads be it to fetch hither Vishnavat the son of Phil, that was my vizier, that he was envious of Shagpat, and whom we spared in our clemency. Some of the guard went from the hall to fulfill the king's injunction on Vishnavat. Others thrust forth Baba Mastufa in the eyes of the king. Baba Mastufa was quaking as a frog quaketh for water, and he trembled and was a tongueless creature, deserted of his lower limbs, and with his eyeballs goggling, through exceeding terror. Now when the king saw him, he contracted his brows as one that peereth on a small and minute object, crying, How, isn't such as he this monster of audaciousness and horrible presumption? Truly tis said, For ruin and the deeds preluding change, fear not great beasts nor eagles when they range, but dread the crawling worm or pismere mean, Satan selects them, for they are unseen. And this wretch is even of that sort, the select of Satan. Off with the top of the reptile, and away with him. Now at the issue of the mandate, Baba Mustafa choked, and horror blocked the throat of confession in him, so that he did not save stagger imploringly. But the prompting of Nurna sent Kazda to the foot of the throne. And Kazda bent her body, and exclaimed, O king of the age, "'Tis Kazda, the espoused of Shagpat, thy servant, that speaketh. 
and lo, a wise woman has said in my ear, How if this emissary and an instrument of the evil one, this barber, this filthy fellow, be made to essay on Shagpat, before the people his science and his malice? For tis certain that Shagpat is surrounded where he sitteth, by genie invisible, defended by them, and no harm can hap to him, but an illumination of glory and triumph manifest. And for this barber his punishment can afterwards be looked to, O great king. The king mused a while, and sank in his beard. Then said he to them that had hold of Baba Mustafa, watching for the signal, I have thought over it, and the means of bringing double honor on the head of Shagpat. So release this fellow, and put in his hands the tackle taken from him. This was done, and the people applauded the wisdom of the king, and crowded forward with sharpness of expectation. But Baba Mustafa, when he felt in his hands the tackle, the familiar instruments, strength and wit returned to him in petty measures, and he thought, Perchance there'll yet be time for my nephew to strike, if he fail me not. Fool that I was to look for glory, and not leave the work to him, for this shagpat is a mighty one, powerful in fleas, and it needeth something other than tackle to combat such as he. A mighty one, said I, by Allah, he's awful in his mightiness. So Baba Mustafa kept delaying, and feigned to sharpen the blade, and the king called to him, Haste to the work! Is it for thee, vile wretch, to make preparation for the accursed thing in our presence? And the people murmured, and waxed impatient, and the king called again, Thou to say this, thou wretch, without a head, but let another minute pass. So when Baba Mustafa could delay no longer, he sighed heavily, and his trembling returned, and the power of Shagpat smote him with an invisible hand, so that he could scarce move. But dread pricked him against dread, and he advanced upon Shagpat to shear him, and assumed the briskness of the barber, and was in the act of bending over him to bring the blade into play, when, behold, one of the chamberlains of the king stood up in the presence and spoke a word that troubled him. And the king rose and hurried to a balcony, looking forth on the desert. And on three sides of the desert three separate clouds of dust were visible. And from these clouds presently emerged horsemen with spears and pennons and plumes. And he could discern the flashing of their helms and the glistening of steel plates and armor of gold and silver. Seeing this, the color went from the cheeks of the king, and his face became as a pinched pomegranate. And he cried aloud, What visitation's this? Away, we are beset, and here is abasement brought on us without self-abasing. Meantime these horsemen detached themselves from the main bodies, and advanced at a gallop, wheeling and circling around each other toward the walls of the city. And when they were close, they lowered their arms and made signs of amity, and proclaimed their mission in the name of him they served. So tidings were brought to the king that the lords of the three cities, with vast retinues, were come, by reason of a warning, to pay homage to Shagpat, the son of Shimpur. And these three cities were the cities of Ub, and of Gath, and of Shiraz, even these. Now when the king heard of it, he rejoiced with an exceeding joy, and arrayed himself in glory, and mounted a charger, the pride of his stables, and rode out to meet the lords of the three cities, surrounded by the horsemen of his guard. And it was within a half a mile of the city walls that the four sovereigns met, and dismounted and saluted and embraced, and bestowed on one another kingly flatteries, and the titles of cousin and brother. So when the unctions of royalty were over, these three kings rode back to the city with the king that was their host and the horsemen of the three kingdoms pitched their tents and camped outside the walls, making cheer. Then the king of the city of Shagpat related to the three kings the story of Shagpat, and the attempt that had been made on him, and in the great hall of justice he ordained the erecting of thrones for them whereon to sit. And they, when they had paid homage to Shagpat, sat by him on either side. Then the king cried, This likewise owe we to Shagpat our glory. See now how the might that's in him shall defeat the machinations of evil, O my cousins of Ulb and of Gaf and of Shiraz. Thereupon he called, Bring forth the barber. So Baba Mustafa was thrust forth by the soldiers of the guard, and the king of Shiraz, who was no other than the great king Shapushan, exclaimed when he held Baba Mustafa, He, why it is the prince of barbers and talkative ones, hath he not operated on my head, the head of me in old time? Truly now, if it be in man to shave Shagpat, the hand of this barber will do it. And the king of Ob, 
peered on Baba Mustafa, crying, Even this fellow I bastinoed. And the king of Gaff, that was Kruznik, famous in the annals of the time, said aloud, I'm amazed at the pertinacity of this barber. To my court he came, searching some silly nephew, and would have shaved us all in spite of our noses. Yea, talked my chief visor into a deep sleep, and so thinned him, and there was no safety from him save in thongs and stripes and lashes. Now upon that the king of the city cried, Be the will of Allah achieved, and the inviolacy of Shagpat made manifest. Thou, barber, thou, do thy worst to contaminate him, and take the punishment in store for thee. And if it is written thou succeed, then keep thy filthy life, small chance of that. Baba Mustafa, remember the poet's word. The abyss is worth a leap, however wide, when life, sweet life, is on the other side. And he controlled himself to the mastery of his members, and stepped forward to essay once more the shaving of Shagpat. Lo, the great hall was breathless, naught heard save the splashing of the fountain in its fall, and the rustle of the robe of Baba Mustafa as he aired his right arm, hovering round Shagpat like a bird about the nest. And he was buzzing as a bee ere it entereth the flower, and quivered like a butterfly when tis fluttering over a blossom. And Baba Mustafa sniffed at Shagpat within arm's reach, fearing him, so that the people began to hum with a great rapture. And the king Shapushan cried, Aha, mark him, this monkey knoweth the fire. But the king of the city of Shagpat was wroth, and commanded his guards to flourish their scimitars. And the keen light cut the cords of indecision in Baba Mustafa, and drove him upon Shagpat with a dash of desperation. And lo, he stretched his hand and brought down the blade upon the head of Shagpat. Then was the might of Shagpat made manifest, for suddenly in his head the identical rose up straight, even to a level within the roof of that hall, burning as it had been an angry flame of many fiery colors. And Baba Mustafa was hurled from him a great space like a ball that reboundeth, and he was twisting after the fashion of envenomed serpents, sprawling and spurning and uttering cries of horror. Surely to see that sight the four kings and the people bit their forefingers and winked till the water stood in their eyes. And Kadza, turning about, exclaimed, This owe we to the wise women, where lurketh she? So she called about the hall, Wise woman, wise woman. Now, when she could find Nurna bin Nurka nowhere in that crowd, she shrieked exultantly, "'Twas a genie, Wulaha. All Afrites, male and female, are in the service of Shagpat, my light, my eyes, my sun, I his moon. Meantime the king of the city called to Baba Mustafa, Hast thou had enough of barbering, O vile one? Ho, a second essay on the head of Shagpat. So shall the might that's in him be indisputable, bruited abroad, and a great load upon the four winds. Now Baba Mustafa was persuaded by the scimitars of the guard to a second essay on the head of Shagpat and the second time he was shot away from Shagpat through the crowd and great assemblage to the extreme end of the hall where he lay wreathing about, abandoned in loathliness. And he in his despondency and despite of protestation and the slackness of his limbs was pricked again by the scimitars of the guard to a third essay on the head of Shagpat, people jeering at him for they were joyous, light of heart. And lo, the third time he was shot off violently and whirled away like a stone from a sling, even into the outer air and beyond the city walls, into the distance of waste places. And now a great cry arose from the people, as if it were a song of triumph, for the identical stood up wrathfully from the head of Shagpat, burning in brilliance, blinding to look on, he sitting inanimate beneath it, and it waxed in size and pierced through the roof of the hall, and was a sight to the streets of the city. And the horsemen camped without the walls beheld it and marveled, and it was as a pillar of fire to the solitudes of the desert afar, and the wild Arab and wandering Bedouins and caravans of pilgrimage. Distant cities asked the reason of that appearance, and the cunning fakir interpreted it, and the fervent divrish expounded from it, and messengers flew from gate to gate and from land to land in exaltation, and barbers hid their heads and were friendly with the fox and his earth because of that light. So the identical burned on the head of Shagpat, as in wrath, and with exceeding splendor of attraction, three nights and three days. And the fishes of the sea shoaled to the sea's surface and stared at it, and the fowls of the air congregated about the fury of the light, with screams and mad flutters, 
till the streets and mosques and minarets and bright domes and roofs and cupolos of the city of Shagpat were blackened with scorched feathers of the vulture and the eagle and the rook and the raven and the hawk and other birds sacred and obscene. So was the triumph of Shagpat made manifest to men and the end of the world by the burning of the identical three days and three nights. End of chapter 22 Recording by Rick Cornwall Section 30 of The Shaving of Shagpat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Cornwall The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith Chapter 23 The Flashes of the Blade Now it was the morning of the fourth day, and lo, at the first leap of the sun of that day, the flame of the identical abated in its fierceness, and it dwindled and darkened and tapered and flickered feebly, descending from its altitude in the heavens and through the ceiling of the hall, and lay down to sleep among the intricate links and frizzled convolutions and undulating weights flowing from Shagpat, an undistinguished hair, even as the common hairs of his head. So upon that the four fasting kings breathed, and from the people of the city there went up a mighty shout of gladness and congratulation at the glory they had witnessed. And they took the air deeply into their chests, and were as divers that have been long fathoms deep under water and extend and puff hard and press the water from their eyes, that yet refuse to acknowledge with the recognition the things that be in the sights above, so amazed are they with unmentionable marvels and treasures and profusions of jewels and splendid lazy growths and lavish filmy illuminations and multitudinous pearls and shearing shells that lie heaped in the beds of the ocean. As the poet has said, after too strong a beam, too bright in glory, we ask, is this a dream or a magic story? And, he says, when I've had rapturous visions such as make the sun turn pale and suddenly awake, long must I pull at memory in this beard, ere I remember men and things revered. So was it with the people of the city, and they stood in the hall and winked staringly at one another, shouting and dancing at intervals capering with mad gravity, exclaiming on the greatness of that that they had witnessed. And Zeal, the garlic-seller, fell upon Mob, the confectioner, and cried, Was this so, O Dob? Woolaha! This glory, was it verily? And Dob peered dimly upon Zeal, whispering solemnly, Say now, art thou of a surety that Zeal, the garlic-seller, known to me, my boon-fellow? And the twain turned to Salop, the broker, and exchanged interjections with him and with Azawul the builder, and with Cruz el Krazawak the carrier, and they accosted Boodleback the drum-beater, where he stood apart, drumming the air as to a march of triumph, and no word would he utter, neither to Zeal nor to Salop, nor to Cruz el Krazawak, nor to Azawul his neighbor, nor to any present, but continued drumming on the air, rapidly as in answer, increasing in the swiftness of his drumming till it was a rage to mark him and the excitement about Boodleback became as a mad eddy in the midst of a mighty stream. He drumming the air with exceeding swiftness to various measures, beating before him as on the tightened skin, lost to all presences save the identical and Shagpat. So they edged away from Boodleback in awe, saying, He's inspired, Boodleback. Tis the triumph of Shagpat that he drummeth. They feigned to listen to him till their eyes deceived them, and they rejoiced in the velocity of the soundless tune of Boodleback the drum-beater, and were stirred by it, excited to a forgetfulness of their fasting. Such was the force of the inspiration of Boodleback the drum-beater, caused by the burning of the identical. Now the four kings, when they had mastered their wits, gazed in silence on Shagpat, and were as they that have swallowed a potent draught, and ponder sagely over the gulp. Surely the visages of the king of Shiraz, and of Gath, and of Ub, betokened dread of Shagpat, and amazement at him. But the king of the city exalted, and the shining of content was on his countenance. And he cried, Wondrous! And again, Woolaha, wondrous! And O glory! And he laughed, and clucked, and chuckled. And the triumph of Shagpat was to him as a new jewel in his crown, outshining all others. And he was for a while as the cock smitten with the pride of his comb the peacock magnified by admiration of his tail. Then he cried, For this praise we Allah and the Prophet. Woolaha, t'was wondrous. 
and he went off again into a roll of cluckings and chucklings and exclamations of delight, crying, Need they further proof of the power in Shagpat now? Has he not manifested it? So true is it that saying, The friend that flattereth weakened at length, it is the foe that calleth forth our strength. Wondrous, and never knew earth a thing to equal it in the range of marvels. Now ere the last word was spoken by the king, there passed through the sky a mighty flash. Those in the hall saw it, and the horsemen of the three cities encamped without the walls were nigh blinded by the keenness of his blaze. So they looked into the height, and saw straight over the city a speck of cloud, but no thunder came from it. And the king cried, These be genie. The issue of this miracle is yet to come. Look for it, and exult. Then he turned to the other kings, but they were leaning to right and left in their seats, as to the intoxicated, without strength to answer his questioning. So he exclaimed, A curse on my head! Have I forgotten the laws of hospitality? My cousins are famished. He was giving orders for the spreading of a sumptuous banquet, when they passed through the sky another mighty flash. They awaited the thunder this time confidently, yet none came. Suddenly the king exclaimed, "'Tis the wrath of Shagpat that his assailants remain uncasticated." Then cried he to the eunuchs of the guard, "'Hither with Fishnevat, the son of Phil. And the king said to Fishnevat, "'Thou plotter, envious of Shagpat, here the king Krishnak fell forward at the feet of Shagpat from sure inanition, and the king of the city ordered instantly wines and viands to be brought into the hall, and commenced saying to Fishnavat, in the words of the wise in tabulature, Of reckless mercy thus the sage declared, more culpable the sparer than the spared, for he that breaks one law breaks one alone, but who thwarts justice flouts law's sovereign throne. And have I not been over-merciful in thy case? As the king was haranguing Fishnavat, his nostril took in the stream of the viands and the fresh odors of the wines, and he could delay no longer to satisfy his craving, but caught up the goblet and drank from it till his visage streamed the tears of contentment. Lo, while he put forth his hand tremblingly, as to continue the words of his condemnation of the vizier, the heavens were severed by a third flash, one exceeding in fierceness the other flashes. And now the great hall rocked, and the pillars and thrones trembled, and the eyes of Shagpat opened. He made no motion, but sat like a wonder of stone, looking before him. Surely Kadza shrieked, and rushed forward to him from the crowd, yet he said nothing, and was as one frozen. So the king cried, He waketh, the flashes precedeth his awakening. Now shall he see the vengeance of kings on his enemies. Thereupon he made a signal, and the scimitars of the guard were in air over the head of Fishnavat, when darkness as of the dropping of night fell upon all, and the darkness spake, saying, I am Abarak of the bar, proceeder of the event. Then it was light, but the ears of every soul present were pierced with the wailing of wild animals, and all sides from the desert hundreds of them were seen making toward the city, some swiftly, others at a heavy pace and when they were coming near they crouched and fawned, and dropped their dry tongues as in awe. There was the serpent, meek as before the days of sin, and the leopard slinking to get among the legs of men, and the lion came trumbling along in utter flabbiness, raising not his head. Soon the streets were thronged with elephants and lions and sullen tigers, and wild cats and wolves, not a tail erect among them. Great was the marvel. So the king cried, We're in the thick of wonders. Banquet we lightly while they increase upon us. What's yonder little man? This was Abarak that stood before the king, and exclaimed, I am the darkness that announces the mastery of the event, as a shadow before the sun's approach, and it is the shaving of Shagpat. The world darkened before the eyes of the king when he heard this, and in a moment Abarak was clutched by the soldiers of the guard, and dragged beside Fishnavat, to await the final blow. And this would have parted two heads from two bodies at one stroke. But now Norna bin Norka entered the hall, veiled and in the bright garb of a bride, with veiled attendants about her, and the people opened to give her passage to the throne of the king. So she said, Delay the stroke yet a while, O head of the magnanimous. I am she claimed by Shagpat. Surely I am the bride of him that is master of the event, and the hour of bridals is the hour of clemency. The king looked at Shagpat, perplexed, but the eye of Shagpat gazed as unto the distance of another world. Then said he, We shall hear naught from the mouth of Shagpat till he is avenged, 
until then he is as silent with exceeding wrath. Hearing this, Norna ran quickly to a window of the hall, and let loose a white dove from her bosom. Then came there that flash which is recorded in all traditions as the fourth of flashes of thunderless lightnings, after the passing of which hundreds of fakers that had been awaiting it saw nothing further on this earth. Down through the hall it swept, and lo, when the kings and the people recovered their sight to regard Shagpat, he was, one side of him, clean shorn, the shaven side shining as the very moon. Surely from that moment there was no longer aught mortal in the combat that ensued, for now, while amazement and horror palsied all present, the genie Karaz, uttering a howl of fury, shot down the length of the hall like a black storm-bolt, and caught up Shagpat, and whirled off with him into the air, and they beheld him dive and dodge the lightnings that beset him from the upper heaven, catching Shagpat from them, now by the heels, now by the hair remaining one side of his head. This lasted a full hour, when the genie paused a second, and made a sheer descent into the earth. Then saw they the wings of Kuruk, each a league in length, overshadow the entire land, and on the neck of the bird sat Shibla Bagarag, cleaving through the earth with his blade, and he sat on Kurok as the moon sits on the midnight. There was no light save the light shed abroad by the flashes of the blade, and in these they beheld the air suffocated with Aphrites and genie in a red and brown and white heat, followers of Karaz. Strokes of the blade clove them, and their blood was fire that flowed over the feathers of Kurok, lighting him in a conflagration. But the bird flew constantly to a fountain of earth below and extinguished it. Then the battle recommenced, and the solid earth yawned at the gashes made by the mighty blade, and its depths revealed how Karaz was flying with Shagpat from circle to circle of the under-regions, hurrying with him downward to the lowest circle that was flaming to points, like the hair of vast heads. Presently they saw a wondrous quivering flash divide the genie, and his heels and head fell together in the abysses, leaving Shagpat prone on great braziers of penal flame. Then the blade made another hissing sweep over Shagpat, leaving little of the wondrous growths on him save a top-knot. But now was the hour struck when Rabbiskaret could be held no longer serving the fairy in Achilles, and the terrible queen streamed in the sky like a red disastrous comet and dived eagle-like into the depths, reascending with Shagpat in her arms, cherishing him, and lo, there was suddenly a thousand Shagpats multiplied about, and the hand of Shibili Bagrag became exhausted with hewing at them. The scornful laugh of the queen was heard throughout earth as she triumphed over Shibili Bagarag with hundreds of Shagpats, illusions, and he knew not where to strike at the Shagpat, and was losing all sleight of hand, dexterity, and cunning. Norna shrieked, thinking him lost, but Abarak seized his bar, and leaning it in the direction of Aklis, blew a pellet from it that struck on the eye of Aklis, and this sent out a stretching finger of beams, and singled forth very Shagpat from the midrids of semblances, so that he glowed and was ruddy, the rest cowering pale, and dissolving like salt grains in water. Then saw earth and its inhabitants how the genie Karaz reascended in the shape of a vulture with a fire peak, pecking at the eyes of him that wielded the sword, so that he was bewildered and shook this way and that over the neck of Kuruk striking wildly, languidly, cleaving towers and palaces, and monuments of earth beneath him. Now Shibla Bagarag discerned his danger, and considered, The power of the sword is to sever brains and thoughts. Great is Allah, I'll seek my advantage in that. So he wheeled Kuruk thrice in the crimson smoke of the atmosphere, and put the blade between the first and second thought in the head of Rabbiskarit whereby the sense of the combat became immediately confused in her mind, and she used her powers as the fool does, equally against all, for the sake of mischief solely, no longer mistress of her own illusions, and she began doubling and tripling, shield the bearer rag on the neck of monstrous birds, speeding in draggled flightiness from one point of the sky to another. Even in the terror of the combat, Shibli Bagarag was fair to burst into a fit of violent laughter at the sight of the queen, wagging her neck loosely, perking it like a mad raven. And he took part, and swept the blades rapidly over Shagpat as she dandled him, leaving Shagpat but one hair remaining on him. Yet was that the identical, and it arose, and was a serpent in his head, and from its jaws issued a river of fiery serpents. These and a host of Aphrodites besieged Shibli Bagarag. 
and now to defend himself he unloosed the twin genii, Caravigius and Viraj Rush, from the wrist of that hand which wielded the sword of Aklis, and these alternately interwound before and about him, and were even as a glittering armor of emerald plates, warding from him the assaults of the host, and lo, he flew, and the battle followed him over blazing cities and lands on fire with the slanting hail of sparkles. By this time every soul in the city of Shagpat, kings and people, all save Abarak and Nurna bin Nurka, were overcome and prostrate with their faces to the ground. But Nurna watched the conflict eagerly and saw the head of Shagpat sprouting incessant fresh crops of hair, despite the pertinacious shearing of her betrothed. Then she smote her hands and cried, Yea, though I lose my beauty and the love of my betrothed, I must join in this, or he'll be lost. So saying to Abarak, Watch over me, she went into the air, and as she passed, Rabiscarat was multiplied into twenty damsels of loveliness. Then Abarak beheld a scorpion following the twenty in mid-air, and darting stings among them. Nurna tossed a ring, and it fell in a circle of flame around the scorpion. So while the scorpion was shooting in squares to escape from the circle, the fire-beaked vulture flew to it, and fluttered a dense rain which swallowed the flame, and the scorpion and the vulture assailed Nurna, that was changed to a golden hawk in the midst of nineteen other golden hawks. Now as Rabiscarat came scudding by and saw the encounter, she made the twenty hawks a hundred. The genie Karaz howled at her and pinioned her to a pillar below in the desert, with Shagpat in her arms. But as he soared aloft to renew the fight with Nurna, Shibli Bagarag loosed to her aid the slaves of the sword, and Abarak marked him slope to a distant corner of earth, and reascend in a cloud, which drew swiftly over the land toward the great hall. Lo, Shibli Bagarag stepped from it through a casement of the hall, and with him Shagpat, a slack weight, made it out of all power of motion. Kuruk swooped low, and on his back Baba Mustufa and Shibla Bagarag flung Abarak beside him on the bird. Then Kurak whirred off with them, and while the heavens raged, Shibla Bagarag prepared a rapid lather, and dashed it over Shagpat, and commenced shearing him with lightning sweeps of the blade. "'Twas as a racing wheel of fire to see him. Suddenly he desisted, and wiped the sweat from his face. Then calling on the name of Allah, he gave a last cunning sweep with the blade, and following that the earth awfully quaked and groaned, as if speaking in the absolute tongue the mastery of the event to all men. Aklis was revealed in burning beams as of a sun, and the trouble of the air ceased, vapors slowly curling to the four quarters. Shibla Bagarag had smitten clean through the identical. Terribly had Nurna and those that aided her been oppressed by the multitude of their enemies, but in a moment these melted away, and Karaz, together with the scorpion that was Guralka, vanished. Day was on the baldness of Shagpat. End of chapter 23 Recorded by Rick Cornwall Section 31 of The Shaving of Shagpat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith Conclusion so was shaved Shagpat, the son of Shimpur, the son of Shulpi, the son of Shulam, by Shibli Bagarag of Shiraz, according to preordainment. The chronicles relate that no sooner had he mastered the event than men on the instant perceived what illusion had beguiled them, and, in the words of the poet, the blush with which their folly they confess is the first prize of his supreme success. Even Boodleback, the drum-beater, drummed in homage to him, and the four kings were they that were loudest in their revilings of the spouse of Kadza, and most obsequious in praises of the master. The king of the city was fain to propitiate his people by a voluntary resignation of his throne to Shibli Bagarag, and that king took well to heart the wisdom of the sage when he says, Power on illusion based or toppeth all, the more disastrous is its certain fall. Surely Shibli Bagarag returned the sword to the sons of Aklis, flashing it in midnight air, and they with the others did reverence to his achievement. 
they were now released from the toil of sharpening the sword a half cycle of years to wander in delight on the fair surface of the flowery earth breathing its roses wooing its brides for the mastery of an event lasteth among men the space of one cycle of years and after that a fresh illusion springeth to befool mankind and the seven must expend the concluding half cycle in preparing the edge of the sword for a new mastery as the poet declareth in his scorn some doubt eternity from life begun has folly ceased within them sire to son so ever fresh illusions will arise and lord creation until men are wise and he adds that is a distant period so prepare to fight the false o youths and never spare for who would live in chronicles renowned must combat folly or as fool be crowned now for the kings of shiraz and of gath shibli bagarag entertained them in honour but the king of ulb he disgraced and stripped of his robes to invest baba mustapha in those royal emblems a punishment to the treachery of the king of ulb as is said by abu esnal when nations with opposing forces rash shatter each other thou that wouldst have stood apart to profit by the monstrous feud thou art the surest victim of the crash take colours of whichever side thou wilt and steadfastly thyself in battle range yet having taken shouldst thou dare to change suspicion hunts thee as a thing of guilt baba mustapha was pronounced sovereign of ulb amid the acclamations of the guard encamped under the command of ravaloke without the walls no less did shibli bagarag honour the benefactor of noorna making him chief of his armies and he with his own hand bestowed on the good old warrior the dress of honour presented to him by the seven sons charactered with all the mysteries of Aklis, a marvel lost to men in the failure to master the illusion now dominating earth so then of all that had worshipped shagpat only kadza clung to him and she departed with him into the realms of rabesqurat who reigned there divided against herself by the stroke of the sword the queen is no longer mighty, for the widening of her power has weakened it, she being now the mistress of the single thoughted, and them that follow one idea to the exclusion of a second. The failure in the unveiling of her last cherished illusion was in the succumbing frailty of him that undertook the task, the world and its wise men having come to the belief that in thwackings there was ignominy to the soul of man, and a tarnish on the lustre of heroes on that score hear the words of the poet a vain protest ye that nourish hopes of fame ye who would be known in song ponder old history and duly frame your souls to meek acceptance of the throng lo of hundreds who aspire eighties perish nineties tire they who bear up in spite of wrecks and racks were seasoned by celestial hail of thwacks fortune in this mortal race builds on thwackings for its base thus the all-wise doth make a flail a staff and separates his heavenly corn from chaff think ye had he never known noorna a belabouring crone shibli bagarag would have shaved shagpat the unthwacked lives in chronicle a rat tis the thwacking in his den maketh lions of true men so are we nerved to break the clinging mesh which tames the noblest efforts of poor flesh feshnavat became the master's vizier and abarak remained at the right hand of shibli bagarag his slave in great adventure no other condition than bondage gave peace to abarak he was of the class enumerated by the sage who with the strength of giants are but tools the weighty hands which serve selected fools now this is how it was in the case of baba mustapha and the four kings and feshnavat and abarak and ravalok and kadza together with shagpat but in the case of noorna bin noorka surely she was withering from a sting of the scorpion shot against her bosom but the seven sons of aklis gave her a pass into aklis on the wings of kuruk and gulravaz the daughter of aklis tended her she that was alone capable of restoring her and counteracting the malice of the scorpion by the hand of purity 
so Nurna prospered, but Shibli Bagarag drooped in uncertainty of her state, and was as a reaper in a field of harvest, around whom lie the yellow sheaves, and the brown beam of autumn on his head, the blaze of plenty. Yet he is joyless and stands musing, for one is away who should be there, and without them the goblet of success giveth an unsweetened draught, and there is nothing pleasant in life, and the flower on the summit of achievement is blighted. At last, as he was listlessly dispensing justice in the great hall, seven days after the mastery of the event, lo, Nurna, in air, borne by Gulravaz, she fair and fresh in the revival of health and beauty, and the light of constant love. Of her entry into the great hall, to the embrace of her betrothed, the poet exclaims, picturing her in a rapture, her march is music, and my soul obeys each motion, as a lute to cunning fingers, I see the earth throb for her, as she sways, wave-like in air, and like a great flower lingers, heavily over all, as loath to leave what loves her so, and for her loss would grieve. But, oh, what other hand than heavens can paint her eyes, and that black bow from which their lightning pierces afar, long lustrous eyes that faint in languor or with stormy passion brightening within them world in world lights up from sleep and gives a glimpse of the eternal deep sigh round her odorous winds and envious rose so vainly envious with such blushes gifted bow to her die strangled with jealous throes o bulbul when she sings with brow uplifted gather her happy youth and for thy gain, thank him who could such loveliness ordain. Surely the master of the event advanced to her in the glory of a sultan, and seated her beside him in majesty, and their contract of marriage was read aloud in the hall, and witnessed and sealed. Joyful was he. Then commenced that festival which lasted forty days, and is termed the festival of the honours of hospitality to the sons of Aldis wherein the head cook of the palace, Uruish, performed wonders in his science, and menaced the renown of Zermak, the head cook of the king Shamsherin. Even so the confectioner, Dab, excelled himself in devices and inventions, and his genius urged him to depict in sugars and pastes the entire adventures of Shibli Bagarag in search of the sword. Honour we Uruish and Dab, as the poet saith, Divide not this fraternal twain, one are they, and one should for ever remain. As to sweet clothes in fine music we look, so the confectioner follows the cook. And one of the sons of Aklis, Zaragal, beholding this masterpiece of Dob, which was served to the guests in the great hall on the fortieth evening, was fair to exclaim in extemporaneous verse, Have I been wafted to a rise of banquet spread in paradise, dowered with consuming powers divine, that I, who have not failed to dine, and greatly, fall thus upon the cater and wine sedately. So there was feasting in the hall, and in the city, and over earth, great pledging the sovereign of barbers, who had mastered an event, and became the benefactor of his craft and of his kind. To certain the race of the Bagarags endured for many centuries, and his seed were the rulers of men, and the seal of their empire stamped on mighty wax the tackle of barbers. Now, of the promise made by the sons of Aklis to visit Shibli Bagarag before their compulsory return to the labour of the sword, and to recount to him the marvel of their antecedent adventures, and of the love and grief nourished in the souls of men by the beauty and sorrowful eyes of Gulravaz, that was mined the bleeding lily, and of her engagement to tell her story, on occasion of receiving the firstborn of Nurna to nurse for a season in Aklis, and of Shibli Bagarag's restoration of towns and monuments destroyed by his battle with Karaz, and of the constancy of passion of Shibli Bagarag for Nurna, and his esteem of her sweetness, and his reverence for her wisdom, and of the glory of his reign, and of the songs and sentences of Nurna, and of his laws for the protection and upholding of women, in honour of Nurna, concerning which the sage has said, Were men once clad in them, we should create a race not following, but commanding fate. 
Of all these records, and of the reign of Baba Mustafa in Ulb, surely the chronicles give them in fullness, and they that have searched say of them, There is matter therein for the amusement of generations. End of section 31. End of The Shaving of Shagpat by George Meredith.